Yes, good. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, good morning, afternoon, evening, good night uh, to <coughs> many of the people here. Thank you very much for coming. This is the GigaNet Academic Symposium, um, which as tradition has been going since 2008 at the IGFs. 2006? Oh, the first one I did was 2008. Sorry, Milton. Thanks for the memory. Um, <clears throat> since 2006 at the, um, at the IGFs, um, we're very grateful to the IGF Secretariat for um, uh, facilitating this meeting um, and getting us uh, in to this jam-packed uh, program for this year with lots of exciting panels going on. Um, well, we have a very exciting uh, conference um, for you today as well. Um, and happy to see so many faces in the room and quite a few people online as well. Um, just a bit of a uh, summary of the, um, the background for this year's symposium. Um, so we were set up, we were informed of the date uh, for the IGF and then went through our rigorous academic procedure for um, selecting uh, abstracts that emerged as a result of a call. We had 59 or 60 abstracts submitted to the workshop and we were able to accept um, only a small number of these. Um, and thank you very much to everybody who participated in this whole process of um, submitting an abstract. Thank you very much to the members of the program committee who actually spent time reviewing the abstracts. It's not easy to do this. So thank you very much to you as well. Um, and thank you to the presenters for actually um, making their way here or staying up very late or getting up very early during today. Um, since we're running a bit late, I'll cut my presentation there. But um, I'm, I'm also... Uh, sorry, I don't know, somebody else, did somebody else want to say something? No. Um, I'm also um, acting as the chair and discussant for the first panel, um, which is taking place right now. We have, and i made a list, we have four presenters, two of whom are here in the room, and two of whom are on site. Um, we will start with a paper by Yik Chan Chin from Beijing Normal University. Yik Chan Chin is also a member of the steering committee um, for the GigaNet um, Association. Um, <coughs> so GigaNet, uh, uh, Yik Chan Chin will be talking about the right to access in the digital era. Then afterwards, we have a paper that, is well, that will be presented by Vagisha Srivastava. Um, on Web PKI and the private governance of trust on the internet. Um, Vagisha is from Georgia Tech. Yes. Okay. Um, and then the third paper will be on internet fragmentation and its environmental impact, a case study of satellite broadband, which will be presented by Berna Akaligur, who is from Queen Mary University uh, in London, and she's sitting on my immediate left. And then the last paper presented in this panel will be on ICT standards in the environment, a call for action for environmental care inside internet governance, which will be presented by Kimberly Anastasio, who is at American University in the US and online. Okay, without further ado, I will pass the floor to Yik Chan. You now have your 10 minutes um, to describe your paper, um, and we'll move into the next paper immediately after that. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Gemma. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Hello? Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, yeah, this is Yi Chen from Beijing Normal University, but actually I'm in London, so this is at 2 a.m. morning, in the early morning of London time. Okay, so uh, so my presentation actually is about uh, uh, right to data assets in the digital era, the case of China. And uh, first of all, I would like to uh, contextualize this debate uh, of data assets in the Chinese context. 
So uh, first of all, we talk about uh, why the debate of, of the assets collection and dissemination of data become the center of the academic debate and the policy making in China, because there are three factors contribute to this discussion. First, first of all, is the internet and the data perceived as the important driving force for economic development. And, uh, and in China, secondly, is the uh, rapid development of platform economy, and also the mass production of data has raised the governance problem in the storage transmission and the use of data in China. And thirdly, is because the role of digital social media platform in data access and dissemination has strengthened the public demand of governments act on the protection right to information in China. So, so for those reasons, you know, uh, uh, the academic debate and the national policy of access to data become a, a very heated, uh, the center of the policy making in recent years. And also, we, we found the, the conceptualization of right to access to data in China and, um, and the formal informal rules, uh, which is related to the legitimacy of the uh, of the right to uh, the public right, to, uh, epistemic right to data is quite uh, interesting. So that's why uh, I uh, focus my study on the relation between the digital access, uh, the right to access to digital data and the epistemic right. And uh, so the data I use in this paper, including the national government's policy regulation and also secondary data. And uh, so what is the epistemic right? So this is a right actually is closely linked to the creation and the dissemination of law really. It's not only about the informed, but also about being informed truthfully, understanding the relevant of information and acting on it is based for the benefit of themselves and the society as a whole. So this is a concept uh, start with. And also the epistemic right is emphasized on the uh, equality, such as equality to access and the availability of information and knowledge, equality in terms of obtaining critical literacy in information communication. So, and uh, also we, we need to understand the concept between data, information, and knowledge. They are interrelated concepts. So data is a set of symbols and uh, kind of the representation of the royal factors. But the information is organized data and the knowledge is understood, uh, understood information. So these con three concepts are interrelated. So therefore, data is the form of knowledge is created through social process. So it's a kind of a social constructed. So therefore, it's interesting to see how the social different social agents participate in the construction of the access right to data as, as part of the creation of the social knowledge. So in my paper, I define different types of digital data, data packet data, and price commercial data. And uh, so I'm not going to details the time limit because of time limitation. So I define the right to access to data uh, to including two elements. The first element is a right to access to public information, which is recognized as individual human rights uh, by many jurisdictions and human rights body. The second is, a, uh, is inclusive right for all members of society to benefit from the availability of data. So this is a mighty definition of access to data in my paper. So, and, uh, and uh, at the global level, there's a different debate about the right to access to data. For example, we got uh, 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 academia recognize the data as a, uh, uh, it's not a public good, but a revelry resource. Uh, but we also get uh, other uh, academic, like uh, Victor from uh, 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 Schumpert from the uh, ORI in, in Oxford, which uh, defined the data as a non revelry information, a public good. Uh, so and uh, it's open to uh, open access. And we also have like a European Commission and the World Economic Forum. They provide different uh, uh, strategy to how to uh, access to data, including uh, data access for all strategy, or like a World Economic Platform, they want to play a data mac marketplace service provider. So therefore, uh, the right to access to data 
can be uh, traded in an open, efficient, and uh, accountable way. So, so therefore, uh, it is tradable. Data is tradable, and uh, they can be managed by a platform provider. Where European Commission's approach is more like uh, uh, data assets for all strategy, and the business requirements data assets have a different requirement, and also creation of common European data space for important areas as well. So, uh, look at the Chinese debate. So the Chinese debate is interesting because they never treated uh, right to access to data as an independent uh, right, but as a part of the right to information and also treated as a data as a property right uh, in China. Because data is not treated as a uh, kind of uh, 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 right to information. Uh, or no, it's not treated as an individual right, but it's treated as a, either right to information or as a property right debate uh, in China. So, um, so in terms of the public information, if the data is owned by government, so that's a different uh, approach. Why is that? Uh, this is uh, the, the public data, which uh, is public good, is owned as if it belongs to all people. So the second approach is the data, public data should belong to the state and the non-public data, like a personal data uh, should be subject to personal uh, uh, productions. Um, but uh, there's no debate about how, uh, 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 what is the, the right to access to the personal data. It's not explicitly discussed. And also the equality nature of the epistemic right, such as equally to access and the availability of information and knowledge has not a draw uh, much Chinese debate, uh, in, uh, attention as well. So data access right, therefore in China is treated as a property right discussions. Okay, so they want to formulate a trading system so that the data can be traded to generate value. Uh, and uh, so that, that is their approach. And, uh, and this, this kind of definition actually is also triggered by the government policy project on the utilization of big data. So therefore, Chinese academic debate are heavily policy driven in this sense, you know, because this is a, the debate and the position of Chinese ac academia is heavily triggered by the government's policy and is policy driven as well. So very few of the academic debate actually support public good nature of data and, uh, and support the uh, data sharing should be the default position and the control of access to data require justification because data is a natural public good. So therefore, we can see the debate is pretty different from the, uh, from the, uh, the other side in the global uh, law. So, so there is the, um, the, uh, the policy, the Chinese government's policy regarding to the gate data, uh, how the access of the data. So from 2015 to 2020, there's a different uh, action plans and the big data development plans. And also the most important plans is uh, uh, opinions on building a better market allocation system and the mechanism for factors of productions. And also this uh, build, building a data space system for the better use of data as a factor of production. So basically the, the policy is defined data property right consists of three rights. And uh, so, uh, so, so they, uh, they treated data as a property and the data has a property right. But this property right consists of three rights. So like uh, uh, one is uh, access right, process right, and exchange right. So the property right uh, is divided into three rights in the Chinese context. So, and uh, in here, we want to uh, look at uh, the definition of the how how do they provide uh, uh, the right to different uh, data? For example, uh, the public data. Uh, this is the data generated by the part, party and government agents, enterprise and institution in performing their duties or in providing public service. So the access policy is uh, strengthen data aggregation and sharing. So they offer, they, you can access to this public data, but you need uh, authorized. And also there's a conditional fee access, but uh, also for particular data, you have to pay for it, okay? And uh, so, uh, 
but the public data is not to be accessed directly. They must be provided in the form of models, product, or service, but not in original data set. You cannot access to the data set, but you can access to the model or product or service you know, generated based on the public data. So the second is personal data. So personal data is about personal information. Uh, and so they can process, uh, process uh, they can collect, hold, host, and use of data with the authorization. But those personal data has to be anonymized, so to ensure the information security and the personal privacy. So protection of the data, right to data, subject to a, 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 a copy and the transfer of the data generated by them. So you have a right to access this personal data, but you can only uh, obtain a copy or transfer the data generated by the platform to other platforms. So this is uh, uh, the, the right uh, 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 offered to access to personal data. But uh, for the enterprise data, data collected and processed by the market uh, in production and business activities, they, they do not involve personal information or public interest. So, uh, so they recognize and protect the enterprise right to process and use of data and protect the right of data collector to use data and obtain the benefit, protect the right to use data or process data in commercial operations. And they also regulate authorize of the data collector for third party. And the original data is not shared or released, but access to data to analyze are shared. So government agents can also obtain enterprise and issue data in a coordinate of law and uh, regulation in order to perform their duties. So this is a, uh, the, the right to access to uh, enterprise data. So the conclusion is that, first of all, access to data is not uh, defined for epistemic right, uh, but uh, in the Chinese context, they have a different, but also similar interpretations. So uh, because of the epistemic right in the Western academic literature, they are more from the sociological nature of the creation and the dissemination of information knowledge. So the right are underpinned by the normative criteria of equal access and the availability of information and knowledge and the use for the benefit of individual and the society as whole. So data is treated as a form of knowledge. Okay, it's a non rival information good, a public good for the benefit of all. So therefore, open access and sharing of non-confidential data is proposed. So in the Chinese context, uh, epistemic right has no, no yet joined any attention of Chinese academic debate. So uh, the close related concept to the epistemic right is right to information, okay? But this right to information is a push from a legal perspective rather than from the sociological perspective. So they are stressing on the commercial rights and also uh, the public right to information right to the public data. So data is defined as one kind of factor of production for the national economic development. So this is very tricky because in the Chinese context, uh, data is defined as a factor of production, you know, there's a four factor of production, like a labor, lands, you know, and the uh, capitals, but the data is defined as a fifth element of factor of production, which is very unique. So, and uh, so therefore, uh, uh, the data is uh, have a non vibrant is, and the non sort. So they recognize data is non sorted characters, you know, but uh, they, 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 they do not, uh, they, but they, they, uh, data cannot be circulated in, in the market like land, labor, and the capital. But uh, the public good nature of the data has not been recognized in the, in the mainstream academic publication of the government's policy. So before, because of this, the public good or equal access uh, uh, or dissemination of data are not uh, are mentioned in the public policy making. So under the, uh, this kind of uh, permits, so therefore, data collection, analyze, and the process are aimed at unlocking the potential commercial value of data, especially for enterprise data, and define the very kinds of data of the data are focus of academic debate and policy contextualizations. So therefore, the data, you know, in the data debate, in the Chinese policy and academic debate, uh, the, the focus is the right and the interest of data enterprise and not the individual right. The power imbalance between the individual and the 
cooperation and the sharing of the benefit derived from data with the individual user and, and the data subjects has not been addressed. Uh, I think that's all my presentation, the argument of my paper. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, and very close to time, so uh, we're starting off well. Um, we'll move. Thank you very much, Yik Chan. Um, I hope you can stick around for the discussion afterwards. Uh, Vagi Shen, we'll move to you right now. Okay. I will, I will share the slides. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Um, I'm going to talk about web public key infrastructure and the private governance of trust on the internet. I know it's a cool title. All credit goes to Dr. Milton Mueller here in the audience. Um, Dr. Carl Grindel, who couldn't join us in person, but is likely joining us virtually. Hi, Carl. And me, the lovely PhD student you would want to have around. And of course, we would, uh, we would like to appreciate the generous grant from the ISOC Foundation for this research. Um, I am going to tell you the story of internet security. And like all good stories, this one too starts with a tragedy. There was a security breach. A company called DigiNotar misissued 500 certificates on the web. It was later identified as a man-in-the-middle attack by Iranian hackers, but the company took no action for two months into the breach until the Dutch government intervened. I was only found out because one of the misissued certificate was for Google. So what is DigiNotar? What's a certificate? And why is the story a significant plot point to what I'm talking about today? OK, so we are all familiar with this. When a user types a web address on the browser, the little lock sign tells us that the connection is secure. HTTPS that we have heard about uh, enables a secure channel for communication, but the browser still needs to identify if the server or the client is in fact who they are claiming out to be. And it is done using digital certificates. Digital certificates authenticate clients on the web. Certificate authorities or CAs issue certificates to website operators upon request. Before issuing certificates, they're supposed to verify the identity of the entity making the request. And the certificates then act as a recorded attestation that the holder is, in fact, who they're claiming to be. 
Web PKI is a web-based component that supports documents digital signing, signature verification, and document encryption, such as the certificates using the public key uh, cryptography or asymmet uh, asymmetric cryptography. Now, before we get into the details of that, let me first lay out what we are trying to do in this paper. There's a bunch of literature out there from the technical community on the workings of Web PKI and the security or lack thereof provided by certificates and certificate authorities. We're looking at it from the governance perspective. We're questioning the commonly held notions of public good and its delivery mechanisms. Public good is often provided by the government, uh, private good provided by the market, and we are situating the governance of Web PKI specifically within the framework of public good being provided by private actors. We argue that the production of public good and some non-public goods require collective action, but not necessarily state action. Governments are but one vehicle of providing these goods, not the only one and definitely not the most efficient one out there. The paper offers an innovative perspective on the dynamics of public production uh, of private goods in the context of internet security. We use the framework of institutional analysis. Uh, we identify the public good in question, then we identify the stakeholders, talk about if they cooperated or compete to achieve the said public good, did they overcome the known barriers to collective action, we then describe the rules within which these stakeholders group institu institutionalized, and finally use some data collected to assess the efficacy of the institutions in achieving the desired result, that is the enhanced security. Okay, shifting gears again. If there are only two parties communicating over the web, as long as these two parties can authenticate each other, the adoption and the use of encryption on the public web does not require any special form of institutionalized collective action. The hard part is the authentication process when there are multiple servers and multiple clients required in the process. It requires a reliable and trustworthy mapping of the private key holder to the public key. In the web PKI ecosystem, digital certificates facilitate this mapping. When a server presents its digital certificate, which includes a public key, during a secure connection setup, the client can verify a certificate's authenticity and trustworthiness. Split key cryptography eliminates the need to transmit private keys over insecure networks. Um, however, it also creates an impersonation problem and certificates solve it for the web. A mismatch between the two, that is the private key and the public key, enables a man in the middle attack. That is something that we saw with the DigiNotar incident. Okay. But this brings us to the question, how do we trust a CA? to not be a bad actor, or worse yet, a compromised actor. There's a chain of trust that enables us to trust a subsequent CA, where each subsequent CA or the intermediary CA has to comply with a certain set of policies set by the browsers. The endpoint, a root CA, is maintained in a root store by browsers and operating systems and has to go through a complex vetting process to be included in the root store program. Now, we have established the authentication is public good. Let's spend a minute understanding why collective action is required. The web ecosystem as a whole needs effective authentication across the board. Security is not a private good because a compromised certificate, certificate or a certificate authority has the potential to affect any website or any users across the system. CS don't al alone have the incentives to provide it themselves and can be motivated by several factors. Browsers and operating systems cannot be responsible for screening a single, every single website on, on the web. The digital ecosystem depends heavily on the trust to work and so needs authentication mechanism to be applicable everywhere and thus needs collective action to be enforced. Now, who are the stakeholders in the ecosystem? We identify four. Security risks are most concentrated on the top at root stores in the browsers and they have diminishing systemic effects as you go down. There are hundreds of certificate authorities, millions of subscribers who get the certificate, and billions of end users and individual devices who rely on these certificates for authentication. According to Malgar Olson, collective action is costly. There are coordination and communication costs, and the bigger the group, the more the cost rise. 
the institutional solutions to the collective action problem for web PKI focus on the top of the hierarchy, that is the browsers and the CAs, and it does not try to directly involve subscribers. The root stores um, add, act as a proxy for the end users, and the certificate authorities act as a proxy for subscribers. Uh, we identify three institutional vehicles, the main character of our story is here, the certificate authority and the browser forum, uh, which we'll be talking about in a minute in more detail, the certificate transparency, which is an internet security standard for monitoring and auditing the issuance of digital certificates through decentralized logging, and ACME, or the automatic certificate management environment, which is a communication protocol for automating interactions between the CAs and their user servers. Okay, so the certificate authority in the browser forum. Remember the DigiNote slide? Well, I might not have been completely honest when I said that the story started with that tragedy. It started a little bit before that, narrator privileges. Um, from 1995 to 2005, certificates were being issued with virtually no standardized governing rules in place. The Certificate Authority and the Browser Forum was founded in 2005. But in 2012 was when the forum started actively making rules for the system. Since 2012, the forum has produced a set of baseline requirements for CAs that tackle con convergence of expectations between the browsers and the CAs on issuing uh, issues such as identity vetting, certificate content and profiles, certificate revocation mechanism, algorithms and key sizes, audit requirements, and delegation of authority. The baseline requirements have been revised about every six months by means of formal ballots uh, approving amended text. The second part of our methodology involves studying the CA browser forum in particular. We first collected data from the forum meetings. This included attendance records, meeting minutes, and we also had 10 semi-structured interviews. Uh, to capture the market share, we used random sampling to subsample around 2 million domains data from the uh, Common Crawls database. Uh, the CAP Forum was described by one of our interviewees as a place for the root stores to coordinate their policies so that they don't create conflicting policies and to get feedback from the CAs directly. While we do see in, on, on the chart that there are more European members than US member organizations within the forum, US participants are more active uh, when it comes to participation. We track the activity of different stakeholders in the forum, and you can see an increase in participation following 2017, um, which was because of an addition of a new working group. Between 2013 and today, the browsers have become more active, and we also note the active participation of either US federal PKI. There are many economic conflicts of interest between the browsers and the CAs, but we can see from our analysis of the voting records that in 92% of the ballots, a majority of both stakeholder groups supported or opposed a proposal. In only 2% of the cases did the browsers favor a proposal that was opposed by a CA. We see uh, this data was collected in February 2023. Uh, we see that Let's Encrypt, which is a civil society effort to encourage the use of encryption and uh, to automate the issuance of certificate is dominating the market. Uh, this didn't used to be the case before, but it clearly showcases how automation has led to increased adoption of DV certificates. If externalities, externalities caused by poor CA practices are the main drivers of collective action, we should expect to see the gradual homogenization of the root stores across browsers OS uh, produced over time. We do see substantial oval overlap in which root certificates and the browsers admit uh, the root certificates into the trust store. We also see a gradual reduction in the number of trusted certificates within the root store over time. Uh, the measure of efficacy is interesting here. We see that the encryption on the web has increased significantly over time, 
We also observed that missed issued certificates have decreased over time. However, while the global missed issuance rate is low, this is predominantly due to the handful of large authorities that consistently issue certificates without error. The three largest uh, CAs that we identified in the market share, Let's Encrypt, Cloudflare, and cPanel, signed 80% of the certificates in the data set and have near zero missed issuance rates. Now, perhaps the most important finding, why have private actors taken the lead in security governance in this case? Well, governments are politically structured such that they cannot represent a global public interest or produce global public goods easily. The authority is fragmented, and there are numerous rivalries among them, especially when it comes to cybersecurity. Uh, platforms have a greater alignment with the security interest of their users than national governments, and in secure web environment hurts their business interests while governments are not directly harmed. Also, they often have a strong interest in undermining encryption and user security for surveillance purposes. The implementation of web PKI involves an elaborate web of technical interdependencies. Security measures impose costs and benefit upon all four stakeholder groups. Those directly involved in the operation and implementation of web PKI standards are in a better position to assess the cost and the risk of the trade-offs and make rational decisions. But the government is not entirely absent. We see USF PKI organizations participating actively. We have observed from the meeting minutes and the interviews that EU is pushing for the EIDAS regulation on this ecosystem. We also see involvement of national CAs, mostly from Asia, representing the interest in the forum. Now, why should you care? Well, a lot of times when insecurities happen in the web, the blame is often put on the users because they engage in unsafe practices. You remember the always proceed option that is available for the certificate mismatch? This is not a perfect system. There are still compromises that can happen because of misaligned incentives or just oversight because of redundancy of the process. In some cases, these could be intentional, example, selling of backdated certificates, but it's always better to lower, know a little bit more. All of the good things about the internet relies on this ecosystem. For example, ensuring cat photos are indeed linked to a secure server, which they claim to be, when you're surfing the web. The topic is also understudied within the internet governance community and hence would be of relevance to the scholars present in the room. Um, okay, so like all good stories, this doesn't end here. We will possibly have a bunch of sequels. We are planning uh, to do a study um, about how governments intervene in the system, get in more detail. We also would like to have the measure, measure of effectiveness of certificate transparency that we mentioned in the institutional vehicle part, and uh, maybe check out if uh, the impact of automation or the ACME on the system. That's all, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Nagisha. You um, again, you did the timing very well. Thanks a lot. Um, we now move to Berna. I will um, just set up your slides on my computer. Um, and in the meantime, I give you the floor. Okay. Do you need your computer? It's okay.
So um, this paper is one of the outcomes of our research project funded by the um, Isaac Foundation, Global Governance of LEO Satellite Broadband. Um, in that project, we um, focused on the jurisdictional challenges to the integration of mega satellite constellations to the global internet infrastructure. Um, the, um, So uh, the report resulting from that study can be found on the website that I'm sharing in our PowerPoint. Um, there you can see the link for a separate ISOC project on Leo satellite connectivity. The ISOC group assessed the subject from a purely policy perspective and we joined our forces at times and I recommend the report as well. Now as we were conducting that study, um, the satellite broadband industry picked up pace. More and more applications have been filed at the International Telecommunications Union for new mega constellation projects. While there's a certain degree of excitement about them, the scientists studying space and astronomy have raised their voices about the impact of these projects on space sustainability and space environment. So we decided to analyze the tension between the competing interests that are universal broadband connectivity for sustainable development and cyber sovereignty on one side and sustainable use of space resources on the other. Of course, from a law and policy perspective, uh, which inspired this paper. It's still a draft, so we welcome any constructive feedback. So what is new about satellite connectivity? We all know that space technologies, satellites have long been a complementary part of the global communications infrastructures. Most often, they have provided last mile solutions in remote and sparsely populated areas, such as islands or villages in mountains, because these areas are not easily served by terrestrial networks. And also, we shouldn't forget we still use them for, uh, when we are in transportation, such as ships and planes, so communication satellites are not new. The idea of multi-satellite uh, systems, the constellations, are not new either. Earlier constellations in the low Earth orbit had emerged in the 90s, Orbcom, Iridium, Globestar are examples. These consisted of smaller number of satellites and they provided speech and narrowband data. They were not viable businesses for mass consumption, they were expensive projects, and they couldn't compete with the speed and capacity of the terrestrial networks, so they didn't really receive much attention. Recently, advances in communications and separate the space technologies, dramatic re reductions in launch costs, financing by the technology sector, and most importantly, the ever-growing broadband demand drove a second wave of satellite constellation ventures. These are very ambitious projects with increased number of satellites. Some leading examples are 42,000 satellites planned by the uh, US venture Starlink, 13,000 satellites planned by the Chinese venture Guawong, and 648 uh, for uh, UK and India venture OneWeb. So newness in the sense is, that the is in the scale of these projects. So how do these um, ventures relate to sustainable development goals? As you all know, for most social, economic, and governmental functions, the use of applications enabled by the low latency high bandwidth connectivity has become even more essential. Low latency is particularly important for the web-based applications that require high speed. Some applications that I can mention are Internet of Things, video conferencing, video games. The new constellations are able to match this requirement because the data travel uh, travels much faster when the communication satellite is in the low Earth orbit simply because the distance is much shorter. So the promise of broadband connectivity with minimal terrestrial infrastructure is almost miraculous from a um, connectivity as an enabler of SDGs perspective. That is why the emergence of these satellites have been met with enthusiasm in the context of their po potential contribution to bridging the global digital divide and, um, uh, and global development. But how does the system work? Are these satellites um, infringing on territorial sovereignty of countries by providing internet from the skies? Well, um, we should first understand um, the technicality behind this um, to understand how the domestic uh, regulations work. 
So the ground stations, they act as a gateway to the internet and or private networks and the cloud infrastructures. Currently, the distance between um, the ground stations is required to not exceed about 1,000 kilometers. The second component is the user terminal by which the users connect, to, connect their devices to receive broadband services. These are provided by the satellite company uh, operating the system. Additionally, satellites need an assigned frequency spectrum, a limited natural resource, as the satellites communicate with the Earth through these um, radio waves. The user terminals will link to the satellite in closest proximity, which may be a different satellite in the constellation at a given time. That satellite will be connected to other satellites, one of which will have a connection to the ground station. Then there is the cloud infrastructure. The satellite companies will use cloud infrastructure, which is a mutually beneficial uh, relationship, as the cloud infrastructures benefit from their connectivi connectivity as backup to their existing setup. As I said, the provision of satellite services within a particular country is subject to that country's laws and regulations. These are called landing rights, and the countries decide the terms of landing rights for themselves, for example, the ground station. For that, the companies will need authorization from each relevant jurisdiction. They will also need to obtain a license to use the frequency spectrum. If they provide their services directly to consumers, they will also likely need an internet service provider license. What is more, the importation of their user terminals will also be subject to import requirements of the um, nat uh, national authorities. So the provision of satellite broadband service by a company is subject to a wide range of laws and regulations of the host country. For example, Russia and China have already declared that they will not allow the provision of satellite broadband by foreign service providers. The countries with space capabilities felt that it would be better if the existing domestic control mechanisms were complemented by ownership and control of their own mega constellations. These have been frequently referred to as sovereign structures. Competition is perceived to benefit markets and end users. So at first glance, it seems like we have, we have more of a good thing. With more choices for all, business models will mature and that should be celebrated. But when we look at the reasoning behind these investments, the governments emphasize their strategic value and the significance of sovereign alternative in infrastructure for digital sovereignty and cybersecurity purposes. The financial viability of these ventures is still not certain, so there isn't much emphasis on that. The digital sovereignty and cybersecurity concerns incentivize countries and regions to align their communication infrastructure and is controlled along their borders. I'm looking at Milton because he um, coined the term um, alignment uh, as fragmentation. So investment in these ventures are also manifestations of the ongoing uh, fragmentation. Um, Okay, so the foreseeable harms of the new competition to space, particularly the orbital environment, are grave. From launch emissions to orbital debris, the current regulatory framework is simply not sufficient to tackle the pro problem in time. In time is the operative word here. Due to exponential increase in the number of space objects, space traffic has become more challenging to manage, and more collusions are anticipated. The space environment is becoming more prone to collusional cascading, which means that once a certain threshold is reached, the total volume of space debris will continue to grow. This is because uh, collusions create additional debris, leading to more collusions, creating a cascading effect. Such a catastrophe may render not only the lower Earth orbit, but almost all space resources inaccessible for all, even for future generations. So because there was a competition among powerful nations to each have as many constellations as they could afford, the orbital environment may become unusable for any service, including connectivity and travel. So future generations may be locked in trying to figure out how to clean up the orbit and restore them. Space resources are limited resources, orbital space is already congested, space traffic is difficult to manage, and there's a risk of collusional cascading. So is the promise of constellations 
especially the multiplication of space-based internet infrastructure, worth the risks we impose on space environment? Do I have one more minute? Or? One more minute. Okay, so uh, I'll go. So, internet governance scholars have known for a long time that advancements in most in information communication technologies are perceived in terms of their potential impact on global power structures. Megasatellite constellations are also deemed strategic investments, both in terms of space presence and in terms of influence and control over global in internet infrastructure. Um, and um, I'll just skip this part. Um, time. So um, the efforts uh, have been deemed to have significant impact on the openness and unity of internet, but now the same can have an impact on the, the uh, anti-fragmentation efforts are deemed to have a significant impact on the openness and unity of the internet. But now the same can have an impact on the sustainability of space resources. So we argue that the impulse to compete in the Earth's orbits, a space that is already congested, should be mitigated in consideration of preserving sustainable orbital environment for future generations. Environment, environmental efforts of global multi-stakeholder internet governance platforms could inform environmental and sustainable outer space governance efforts, especially as they relate to space-based internet infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you very much, Banner. Um, and yes, the timing was perfect. I will now um, move quickly to Kimberly. Kimberly, you are online. All right. Um, and uh, yes, you are online. Um, can we please make Kimberly Anastasio a co host? Thank you. And Kimberly, the floor is yours. And, and we can hear you, or we heard something. All right, can you confirm that everything is working properly? Wonderful, thank you. All right, hello everyone, and thank you to the GigaNet organizers. It is my pleasure to be here today talking to you about a project that is part of my dissertation research at the School of Communication at American University. And this project addresses the intersection of information and communication technologies, ICTs, and the environment focusing on ICT standards. Um, we're meeting now at the IGF and the Internet Governance Forum set the environment as the main thematic track for the first time in 2020. And it is definitely not alone in such an endeavor among internet governance organizations. Recently, there are plenty of standard setting organizations organizations that are establishing rules for how ICTs work and how information circulates on the internet. They are also turning their attention to environmental concerns and working on the creation of what they call, um, quote unquote, greener internet protocols. Um, this paper that I'm presenting today is this first step towards this broader research project on this ICTs standards, in which I talk to people working on ICTs in relation to the environment on the implications that standards can have for enabling and constraining environmental rights, meaning here the right to a healthy, clean, safe, and sustainable environment as established by the United Nations Environmental Program. And this is a research that is rooted um, as part of this communication field called environmental media studies, a field that addresses these overlapping spheres of environmental issues in the production and uses of new media, including ICTs. Um, but still among the researchers uh, that are part of this environmental media studies field, focus tend to be more on data centers, on AI, on the things that are more closely visible to internet users. Um, and one niche but fundamental part of ICTs is usually overlooked, ICT standards. Um, so I'm now joining two infrastructure studies that deal with this more hidden layer of ICTs. Moreover, we know that Internet Governance Scholarship for a long time has been examining internet standardization processes by seeing ICT standards as things that are not just technical, but also things that are political. But when we deal about with the values and politics that can be inscribed into internet governance artifacts such as protocols, we usually focus on those rights that are more, more clo closely related to the digital world, like 
freedom of expression or privacy in data protection. But environmental rights should be considered as this another example of how politics and rights are embedded into internet governance and how then um, ICT standards may be another venue where the politics of around the environment are enacted. Uh, the broader research is an analysis of both the International Telecommunication Union and the Internet Engineering Task Force and the work that they are doing that are related to the environment. For this paper, I relied on semi-structured in-depth interviews that I did with 18 interviewees that are experts that have already advocated for environmental concerns about the internet and if its infrastructures or that have done this uh, or they're currently doing this. So when I talk to the people that are already working on this umbrella between environmental rights in the context of ICTs, I ask them about their knowledge about standards and their perspective on where ICT standards could fit the broader agenda. And despite most of them mentioning that they have very few knowledge on standards, their answers ended up echoing both what is being said on the literature, but also on uh, echo some some things that some standard setting organizations are already working on um, for a while. So echoing the literature interviews situated this debate about ICTs and the environment and these two parallel understandings of the technologies. Um, on one hand, digitalization allowing us to enable a more sustainable economy, so ICTs being employed basically to tackle climate change. And then on the other hand, uh, focusing on the negative aspects of the digitalization, so how digitalization by itself can also have an impact, be it actually positive or negative, on the environment by itself. Um, but in the end, what most of them noted is that to act on this intersection between ICTs and the environment, one should account for both things. So how these standards can help the sector be more environmental friendly um, by enabling other things um, to happen among other sectors, but also how environmental friendly the, techno the ICT technologies themselves can, can be. And then when it comes to establishing what roles these ICT standards could play in, in enabling to account for both these two things, the promises and the pitfalls of, of digital technologies, the experts highlighted two main areas of action. So basically establishing a common language or parameters for dealing with this issue, but also establishing mechanisms for accountability. So, and both of these things were mentioned in relation to the standards that would help us avoid carbon emissions in, in other sectors, but also um, in standards that are trying to account for or cut down the environmental impact of ICT themselves. And at the center of this discussion on the intersection uh, and the role of standards in this case, uh, is basically this necessity for quantification and addressing the materiality of ICTs. And also the fact that these conversations that we're starting to have more on the standards setting organizations are kind of late in the game. And they come in a context in which um, the mindset of the ICT sector is one of evidence and consumerism. Um, and we know that quantification is a vital part of what standards is, be them ICT related or not, because standards are the things that define the procedures, they regulate behaviors, they ensure interoperability, and for that quantifying, classifying, formalizing process, processes is key. But when it comes to measuring the environmental impact of ICTs, be it from any perspective, so software, hardware, or networking, um, this is not an easy task. And, and this means that even when people do recognize the physicality of the internet and the impact that ICTs can have, there is no simple way to quantify its relation to the environment, be it from, again, the carbon footprint, the energy consumption, the natural resources extraction, um, disposability, and, and things of these sorts. Um, but one thing that we have to keep in mind uh, is that materiality is more than just this palpable thing. Um, as seen on the slide, materiality also refers to this shape and affordances of the physical world, but also the social relations that are part of our lived reality. Um, so we, we address ICTs as something that is physically located and situated in the environment. Um, 
although it is surrounded by discourses of immateriality, but to act on this issue does not necessarily mean that we should be stuck if we're not capable of precisely measuring, measuring this entanglement of, of ICTs in nature, or that we should stop at the measuring phase alone, um, precisely because we recognize ICTs as something that is relational. An interview is pointed to something similar um, of like that when they identify what they believe to be the root of the problem. Um, the root of the problem being not the environmental impact of the separate devices, products, services, the separate standards themselves, but the socioeconomic model behind how society deals with ICTs. Um, one, one interviewee, for instance, said that standard setting is really important because it allows for environmental best practices to come in and enter its way at the technical level. Um, but that will be in direct competition with um, the business as usual business model of the entire um, sector. Um, but some standard setting organizations are already engaging in environmental, environmental related discussions, both by creating standards that relate to the environment, but also as organizations themselves engaging in these discussions in other settings. Um, and the two organizations that I'll be studying further um, for my dissertation, as I mentioned, is the ITU um, and the IETF. The ITU um, has already more than 140 standards that are related to the environment. It has one study group that's called Environment and Circular Economy that is dedicated um, to dealing with these issues. The mandate is to work on the environmental challenges on ICTs. And the ITF is something that is more recent since the ITU has been following the UN Sustainable Development Goals for a while. The ITF is now catching up on this issue as well. Um, it has almost 20 standards that are more closely related to, to environmental issues. And it also created recently a group that is dedicated um, to addressing sustainability issues in relation to, to ICTs among them. Um, just to mention a couple of examples, the IETF has been dealing with a protocol for Bluetooth to turn Bluetooth less energy consuming from the perspective of Internet of Things. The ITU has several measurements on the carbon footprint of the ICT um, sector. And as I mentioned, um, the, the scholarship have already established that the standards are these political things that can incentivize or constrain certain behaviors. Two important ICT standard set organizations are already engaging and increasingly acting on environmental matters. And the, the next step for this research is to delve into the work that they're doing and try to investigate what um, areas they are trying to tackle, what interests are also being addressed there, and how can we move forward with this agenda even beyond these two organizations and further down other standardization processes in internet governance too. Um, thank you very much, and I'm available for any questions or comments that you might have. Thanks very much, Kimberly. Um, right, we have a few minutes, and um, I will abuse <coughs> my position as chair and hope that the Danielle, the next, you don't mind starting a couple of minutes later. Uh, just so that because we started late um, right so uh, I will first of all just um, make some comments on the papers that we heard and the papers that um, uh, we received from you thank you very much for those um, before I try and go with some leading questions and hopefully that will stimulate a bit of a discussion. So if you have questions in the audience, already start thinking about how to formulate them and pray that I don't raise them first. <laughs> I'm sure I won't. Okay, so um, I will go through the papers in the order that they were presented. So Yik Chan, um, who is still online, Congratulations, yeah. it's four o'clock in the morning or something, so congratulations. Um, uh, really interesting paper. Um, the, um, the fact that it's already published means that um, my comments are moot, but I was thinking um, of how you could actually take this further. I mean, there's lots of many interesting statements in your paper, and the way you actually position the debates um, around this, and and almost show the similarity between 
the, the, the different approaches that you see in the different regions of the world that you looked at. Um, very interesting. I, I would have loved to have learned more about your reflections on the sociological nature of that, that whole data divide, so data, knowledge, information, and so on, and see how that fits in. Um, one of the things that um, kind of touched me in the paper was that the, the way you explained those, how those differences and those similarities um, come out. And so I was very happy to read that, in, or very, that, that stimulated a lot of thought in my head at least. Um, however, I would have liked you to have been a bit more argumentative in that sense. Um, you laid out some of the conditions and you showed that there are differences and there are similarities. Um, and it would have been nice to see how that plays out in different policy debates that are going on. Because um, I know that the EU has its uh, data for strategy, uh, strategy for data for strategy, <laughs> yeah, strategy for data. Um, and I'm sure that that plays, you know, you could do a really interesting policy analysis on that. And that might be a next step that you want to go for to actually try and um, unpack how these reflections on epistemic rights and so on actually play out in the policy field. Um, that might be really kind of interesting to see how that comes out because, of course, on the one level, there's a lot of conflictual discourse around the different approaches. But what you show is that there are some fundamental similarities as well, and it might be interesting to do that. I was also thinking that there are um, maybe other regions in the world that have different um, approaches to data in that sense, and it might be interesting at some point to also reflect on that, maybe you know, in the, in the paper, in the next publication, maybe interesting to have a section that looks at global approaches and Maybe I know that in Japan they have a different approach to data, to treating data in that sense, so that might be interesting. Um, Vagisha, your paper, and Milton is in the room as well. Uh, I could definitely see the, um, um, the, the, uh, the questions around the governance of this, right? And congratulations for that, because it, it's, I think, also in the paper as I read it, I felt that you would not struggling with it, but it was something that you said, okay, I want to look at this as a governance question and not a technical question, but I need to spend lots of time explaining the technical issues in order to understand the governance side. Um, and so, although you focus on the fact that you want to do a governance paper, as I was reading it, I felt a lot of the technical knowledge, which was very useful, right, but um, actually left little space or mind space for the reader for those bigger governance questions, which are really interesting, right? Um, I, uh, I also was thinking a bit um, about how um, you addressed, so how you, how you, had, you said you talked about your narrative prerogative, right? Um, and how you addressed the story in from 2019 first, but that was maybe the problem that made the context and the, the issue visible, right? So it may, maybe that's how you do that. It's, it's, you don't have to say, I lied, right? <laughs> um, I was also wondering, so um, you mentioned that there are different voting. Um, you, you said that actually the platforms and the um, uh, certificate authorities agree on a lot of things, right? Um, I was wondering, the process leading up to the votes that would be really interesting to, to understand, right? And then, of course, you mentioned that it's um, a private organization dealing with public goods. Um, and I'm going to ask the question that you asked us to ask you. Right? Can you please explain how governments are involved in that? Because they, they are not explicitly involved, but they are involved, right? And that would be interesting to see because, of course, the diff there are multiple dimensions to these stories. And I would have liked to have heard a bit more uh, or teased you, uh, teased you a bit more in that sense. Berna and Joanna, thank you very much for your paper as well. Um, when I first read the title, I thought that um, you were trying to do a lot in this paper. Um, 
it's covering um, uh, low Earth satellite, low Earth orbit satellites. It's covering environmental issues. It's covering cybersecurity issues. It's covering quite a lot in the paper. And I found that um, um, at first I was I was thinking, wow, how are they going to do all this? But you managed, <laughs> so that was good. Um, I was wondering a bit when I looked through the paper, I felt that the ordering was sometimes, there were some bits that probably could have gone a bit earlier in order to help me understand the flow of the paper. So I'll give you some examples later, but I mean, for example, you, you introduced the concept of me mega constellation, and I didn't know what that was until I'd read two pages later. Um, so things like that. But also in the way that the argument builds up, I was wondering section four may be more interesting as section three and vice versa. Um, there are, you've mentioned rightly the security concerns, right? Um, but I was wondering what, uh, so there are also the, the security concerns and the sustainability concerns actually cross over quite a bit, I think, because if somebody were to shoot one of these things out of the sky and if then the cascading effect happens, I was wondering that, that, that you treat them as two separate things. And I was thinking it might be interesting to, to also show that there are direct connections between those two. Um, and then you, of course, you go on and you talk about the ITU. But I know that there have been international collaboration efforts. I know the European Union has been trying, at least, for a long time with a, stra a space policy to develop things. And I was wondering, I didn't really see mention of, of, of that too much. And I thought that might be interesting to bring in because that then addresses the questions that you had um, uh, raised in the tensions between the national and the global. Right? And there I would be interested, you talked about sovereignty as, uh, uh, or states using sovereignty to say we need our own mega constellation. Um, but then in the end, that still needs a coordination effort, right? Unless they want to knock each other out of the sky. Right? So uh, that might be, uh, that's also something that I think you could raise in your, in your paper a bit more, okay? And then in terms of sustainability, it might be worthwhile to clarify at the beginning of the paper what you mean, because I was also thinking, oh, is it more environmentally friendly to put satellites in low Earth orbit? than to have routers or whatever data centers on, on the planet Earth. Um, but actually, no, you meant something else. Okay, Kimberly um, rushing. Um, environmental rights, thank you very much for this paper. Um, a really worthwhile um, effort. It's part of a broader project, and I'd love to know a bit more about how that fits in. I think that could be a bit clearer in the paper. Um, you focus on the role of standards authorities. Um, you look at the IETF and the ITU. Um, I was wondering, in your reflections, do you actually think about the normative biases that are built in to these actors? I mean, you mentioned the work um, that's been done by other scholars that try and unpack those. Um, but right now, you've gone through the interviews and you're looking at those um, quite quite, um, yeah, literally, and I was wondering if you do that. Um, I think there's also quite a lot of work, maybe not directly just on internet standards organizations, but standardizations bodies as a whole. And I know you come from the literature that's looking very much at sustainability and standards, but there may be some work um, also, there was quite a lot of work in, in the 1980s and the early 1990s published in this space. So that might be interesting for you to look at. Um, I was also thinking you do kind of implicitly look, or no, you explicitly mentioned it in your presentation. You look at environmental rights in the human rights context. And um, I think that was very interesting as well. One of the things, I know you're only looking at standards, but another area where there's been quite a lot of uh, reflection is on the implementation of data centers and the environmental consequences of those. And I was wondering if some of those debates in the literature might not be interesting. So those are my far too long, but hopefully useful comments. Um, I would like to see if there are any questions from the floor. Microphones have been put out. So if you want to raise a question, please go and uh, stand behind the mic. 
Um, otherwise, we'll go back to the presenters for a quick response. Milton is going to the f mic. Go ahead. Uh, just a question about the satellite paper. Um, you talked about um, the creation of these government-run mega constellations, and, and somehow that's related to fragmentation. And by the way, I agree with Jamal that it's hard to combine the environmental global commons uh, w tragedy of the commons aspect and the fragmentation aspect of your paper, but I'm going to focus on fragmentation. Um, you know, what what are they actually doing? Are they proposing to not allow other satellites to uh, distribute signals to their country? Uh, and what is their leverage for doing that? And then they're going to set up their own. Why, why do they need to set up their own mega constellation to, to do that if they're only concerned about their own territory? If there are no other questions at this moment, we'll go back to the panelists. Should we go back in the order? Uh, Yik Chan, did you want to mention something? Aisha? Um, thank you for the comments. Um, because of lack of time, I'm not going to address all of them, but I think the, pro the voting process that you asked about was interesting the, when we were going through the ballot readings and everything. Also the interviews. Um, what we learned about was that a lot of formal language that goes to voting is already agreed upon and the consensus mechanism is built pre-voting or pre-setting the language itself. Uh, that could be one of the reasons why a lot of these votes are uh, non-conflicting, but it is still interesting to see how uh, sort of CAs react or the browsers react to the process itself. Do you have any specific question that you want me to answer? No, I think that's perfect. Given the time that we have. Yeah, okay. Um, Joanna may add to my comments if she, I think she's still online. Um, Yes, okay, so uh, Jamal, thank you for your comments, and I agree, um, we are trying to address a uh, few uh, important um, topics all at one, in one paper, and um, I'll um, take a look at um, uh, your uh, recommendations. About the EU space policy, I was thinking that um, the EU space policy and the fact that they are trying to also deploy their own satellite constellation may be a, a contradictory move, um, because I think there was a paper, um, there was an EU paper, um, research paper, represented to the parliament saying that the EU doesn't actually need to own a uh, <laughs> mega constellation for purposes of um, access, but um, they still thought that it was important from a strategic and security perspective, but you know, I should maybe add that to um, the paper. Um, and, um, for uh, about Milton's um, question, so um, from what I understand, uh, from um, my understanding of fragmentation, uh, you know, there are different manifestations of fragmentation, and um, one manifestation is through government policy and regulations, where um, the governments try and establish control over infrastructure and the components used for that infrastructure. So decoupling at, um, uh, at um, the 5G infrastructure, for example, was an example of that, um, whereas um, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, groups of countries have refused to use each other's um, technology for um, uh, cybersecurity reasons, and of course there was um, deeper geopolitical um, motives um, behind that as well. So um, when, um, when I look at the government papers, justifying investment in these mega constellations, which are elaborate uh, infrastructures. The governments uh, refer to them as um, sovereign infrastructures that are necessary also, uh, ne necessary for cyber sovereignty and cyber security reasons. And so th th it is from their policy papers that I see that they uh, see these infrastructures, although they are not terrestrially located within uh, their, um, uh, uh, within, within the land, the control 
of these infrastructure is still uh, with, uh, by the companies that are located within their territories. So they are very much seen as a territorial um, infrastructure from those that can, um, uh, that can deploy these um, <laughs> de de deploy these constellations. So what about the others? I mean, for the previous research that we had done, the countries that cannot have their own mega constellations but are uh, planning to use them uh, see data governance, for example, as a, their major concern. So, um, uh, for example, the gateways to the internet, the ground, uh, the ground, um, uh, the gateways to the internet, the ground infrastructures that are need to be um, uh, th that you need to have every 1,000 kilometers. For example, the countries were saying that if we are going to authorize services of these mega constellations, maybe we would like to uh, require them to have a ground station within our territory, even if they don't need one, even, even if there is one within 1,000 kilometers, and it is f uh, to control, the intention is to control cross-border data transfers. And so it, it is still, uh, you know, it, it, it is the, in, uh, the intention is to control cross-border data transfers um, and, to, uh, and to maintain the control that they already have or um, uh, extend that control uh, in accordance with their policies that are still um, developing as uh, the um, geopolitical tensions intensify. So I hope that was, uh, that answered the question. Thanks. I, I think you have to, add. Joanna, did you want to add something? Nothing further from me. Okay, perfect. Kimberly. Okay. I'll try to be um, very fast and say thank you very much for your comments. Um, Jamal, you mentioned three things that are the things that I'm currently working on, which I think it's very appropriate um, as feedback. Um, and yes, I am trying to now situate my study better among studies that deal more with standardization as a whole and not just standardization from an ICT um, perspective. And also just to explain a little bit further this project, the bulk of the project um, is based on a methodology that involves the content analysis of the almost 200 standards that have been either approved under discussion or rejected in the two organizations that I am analyzing and interviews with the participants of these organizations, so the ITU members and the IETF members. Um, but in order for me to properly understand the work that these two organizations are doing um, in light of the possibilities for the ICT standardization, standardization pro, um, sector as a whole, I thought it was needed for me to come up with a framework of action, not only from the literature on the environmental impact of ICTs, but also from the perspective of those working on the ground trying to build this agenda in international organizations and spaces like that. So that's where this smaller project fits the broader one. It, it is to help me come up with this framework of action through which I'll then analyze how two particular organizations are engaging in this in this matter but thank you very much and i'll wait for your further comments on on the paper so thank you thank you all right thank you very much um, for all of the interesting papers and um, uh, hopefully this has well, I think this has been a great start to the symposium. So thanks very much to all of the speakers and all of the paper writers and everything like that. Thanks a lot. I will now ask you to leave the, the floor. Can we, should we just leave it here? Yeah? You take it from me. Right. Danielle, could I, I think, Given the interests of time, we won't have a five minute break and we'll move straight to the sec second panel. Is that okay with you, Danielle? Uh, yeah, okay, we can have a bathroom break. You will be timed. Uh, <laughs> so um, if you need a couple of minutes, just use a couple of minutes and then otherwise we'll get back to you straight away. Okay. Uh, well. I was gonna. I was gonna say you can sit. I'm gonna sit down there. Yeah. You don't need me, do you? No. no? Okay.
Welcome back, everyone. Um, sorry for the delay. Um, I think we're, we can keep going till 12.45. Um, I'm Danielle Flonk. I'm an assistant professor in international relations at Hitotsubashi University in Tokyo. Uh, and I'll be chairing and discussing this session. Uh, today we have Nanette Levinson, who's presenting on institutional change in cyber governance. Jamie Stewart um, on women, peace, and cybersecurity in Southeast Asia. Uh, Kamesh and Gazim, did I pronounce that? Okay. <laughs> Rizvi on um, making design and utilization of generative AI technologies ethical. Uh, basically, everybody gets 10 minutes to present, after which I will give five minutes of feedback. Um, Nanette? Is Nanette here? Okay, go ahead. Nanette? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Good morning, Kyoto time. Good evening, my time. Good day to whatever time zone one may be on. The papers that were just presented in the first panel set the scene, I think, beautifully. They were fantastic papers, wonderful discussion. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. I believe that's working. Excellent. Um, I'm going to share with you some work from the past year of a project that I've been working on for the last four years. I've been researching the United Nations open-ended working group dealing with cybersecurity that began in 2019 to 2021. And the second rendition uh, continues now and actually it is uh, due to go until 2025. And as we all know, this has been a particularly unusual time period punctuated by a pandemic and the war in Ukraine. What I'd like to do in my presentation is focus just on this past year, 2022 to 2023. I'm going to share with you a few of my key research questions, my major findings, several of them, and just very briefly some thoughts on uh, the future research in this arena. I want to highlight three research questions. I've been thinking about the field of internet governance for a number of, or at least several decades, and I wanted to have a chance in this paper to take a long-term view, thinking about institutional change using various disciplinary approaches. And I was particularly interested in what could be called deinstitutionalization processes in cyber governance. The organization on which I focus uh, within the discussions at the open-ended working group is a proposal for something called a program of action, which involves a more regular way to include other stakeholders, stakeholders other than governments, as a part of regular institutional dialogue related to cybersecurity at the United Nations. In the paper, I formulate a cross-disciplinary approach to these analyses, and I ask the question, how do the findings from this longitudinal study of the open-ended working group relate to work on institutional change? And further, I ask, what possible catalytic factors could be at work related to such changes? And in order to do that, I go back to some work that I did a little bit earlier, where I looked at institutional change indicators and I want to highlight here three of them. First, an indicator for institutional change or incipient institutional change is the absence of an authoritative analogy or the presence of inconsistent isomorphic pulls. Second indicator, a change in the legitimacy of an idea and a change in the rhetoric related to it. Third indicator, and these are not sequential, they're rather a chaotic continuum. Uh, the third one is the emergence of a new variety of organizational arrangements consistent with a new idea. And all of this, all of these indicators, I look against the setting, the backdrop of increasing uncertainty 
and turbulence in the environmental setting of the open-ended working group and indeed major geopolitical pulls. Here are a few of my findings at a glance. My earlier work on the open-ended working group from 2019 to 2021 noted the presence of what I called an idea galaxy. And what I mean by that is simply a cluster of specific words that appear near one another. And the subsequent positioning of these words next to or very near to a value or a norm that is already more generally accepted. So in 2019 to 2021, I discovered the following words, human rights, gender, sustainable development, or international development, or developing country, and less frequently non-state actors or multi-stakeholders. And they often were linked both in oral presentations and in written submissions, and I use content analyses on all of these, they were most often linked to sections dealing with capacity building. Interestingly, the 2021 Open-Ended Working Group final report, which was adopted by consensus, and again, this echoes some of the discussion about consensus in standards organizations highlighted in the earlier papers. Um, interestingly, those words were adopted by consensus in that 2021 open-ended working group. But what has occurred in the past year, 2022, 2023, is a fascinating development. The same idea cluster appears in many submissions, many oral presentations, uh, many informal sessions with other stakeholders, but there also appears another opposing cluster or idea galaxy that I term a dueling idea galaxy. Let me say more about this. We remember the idea cluster that was accepted by consensus in 2021. This appears in much of the discussion and was going to appear and did appear in draft versions of the annual progress report that was supposed to be adopted by consensus at the fifth substantive session just um, oh, a couple of months ago um, in New York City at the United Nations. However, interestingly, um, a dueling idea cluster was introduced on the very last day of that discussion in opposition to accepting the report with those words from 2021 in it as a consensus agreement. And instead, uh, the Russian delegation, along with, I guess, the Chinese delegation, Belarus, and maybe four or five other countries, um, proposed or said that it was not going to go along with consensus, that it strongly wanted, and it had a rationale, um, and I put this in italics, that their idea cluster was were wording such as convention or treaty. And this really signified their commitment to the development of new norms in the cybersecurity area. And it also signified opposition to um, this program of action idea as a part of regular institutional dialogue. I do want to point out that the idea for a treaty was not new in 2022-2023. It appears throughout discussions. But what is new is its placement in direct opposition to the first idea galaxy above, the one that was adopted by consensus in 21. These doing cl dueling clusters reflect the presence of catalytic factors, especially the war in Ukraine, and they provide indications of potential institutional change and increasing turbulence, possibly marking the end of a long cycle of internet governance trajectory that included roles, even though appropriate roles, quote unquote, in certain uh, terminology for non-state actor stakeholders. So let me conclude and talk a little bit about future research. The outcome that I just alluded to of the 2022-2023 discussions in terms of ultimately getting consensus on the annual progress report of the open-ended working group uh, that was just submitted to the General Assembly, I guess in September, um, went down to the very last moments of the very last day of that final fifth substantive session. And the only 
way that the consensus was achieved was by the open-ended working group chair, Ambassador Gafour, who took a suspension and went around to do informal negotiations. And he solved the dissensus by what he termed in his words, quote, technical adjustments to assure the consensus. And a delegation head termed his technical adjustment as footnote diplomacy. Very quickly, the chair crafted two separate independent footnotes, and I call these balancing the dueling ideal galaxies. Each of the footnotes gave a small amount of recognition to each of those idea clusters and set the stage, of course, for further discussion in 2023 to 2024 open-ended working group ahead. And there are many dates set ahead and discussions related to this topic. So in sum, there are indications of potential institutional change. My project is going to continue to identify any emergent or disappearing idea galaxies in the year ahead. These relate to those conflicting isomorphic pulls that I began with as indicators of institutional change. Um, and I hope to be able to use, now that we are primarily post-pandemic, a more mixed methods approach to capture the more individual level idea entrepreneurship in these turbulent times, times that continue to catalyze change processes. And with that, I'm going to turn the floor back to our chair. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Nanette. Um, I really like this paper. I'm going to give feedback now, and then we go to the next paper. So I really like this paper because it addresses the big questions in global internet governance. Um, and it looks at recent developments in an important institution, namely the open-ended working group. Um, I have two broader feedback points, one on theory and the second on empirics. So on theory, a number of things I think could be further clarified. First, you use a lot of concepts, um, especially when you set out the different indicators of institutionalization and deinstitutionalization and the stages of institutionalization. So do you really need all these concepts, such as um, there was habitualization, objectification, sedimentation? Many of these concepts do not come back in the analysis, and I would only focus on those that you actually need for your analysis and define more clearly what you mean by them. Second, you use institutionalization um, and deinstitutionalization de processes as a binary, um, but what about the literature on contested multilateralism? or counter-institutionalization. Um, their authors emphasize competitive regime creation, regime shifting, so there's more than just making and breaking of an institution. Um, for instance, parallel regime creation, right? Like the open-ended working group was an alternative to the UNGGE. Um, institutions can gain in relevance or lose relevance or even become zombies. So is this binary really maybe too limited? Um, with regard to empirics, the findings address three main categories, uh, emerging technologies, crises, and idea galaxies, but where do these categories come from? Why did you pick these and not others? And how are they theoretically related to institutionalization? Um, I think the section about idea galaxies is the most elaborate one, so it's clearer here which topics you focus on. However, I think you could elaborate more on why you focus on certain ideas and not on others. For instance, you focus on issues such as gender, human rights, sustainable development, but why not on other issues such as democracy and equality? Um, also, I think this empirical section could be a paper of its own. So you could consider focusing the paper on idea galaxies only um, and thoroughly setting out your theory and operationalization, and then things like emerging technologies and crises could function maybe more scope conditions to competing idea galaxies. Thank you. Um, I give the floor to Jamie. Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me well. Yes. 
Wonderful. Thank you very much. Let me just um, start my presentation. Thank you all for having me here. And I, I do deeply apologize for being uh, for being remote. I was hoping to be there in person, but was unable to make it. Um, I'm Jamie. I'm um, from UNU in Macau, that is the United Nations University, and I'm a senior researcher and team lead there. I'm going to be talking about something that's quite closely related to the presentation of Nanette, uh, but, but it is a, a little bit of a different focus and a bit of a different focus from some of the other papers here as well, which is um, particularly on gendered orientations towards cybersecurity and particularly within Southeast Asia. So I'm going to be talking about the intersection of internet governance and gender equality as well as human rights, but this is more from a, um, a person-centered perspective rather than from the, the level of governance itself. So it's perceptual in many ways. So first off, um, to, to situate the work, uh, this is situated within concept of human-centric cybersecurity. And human-centric cybersecurity has been used in a variety of different ways, and the, the, the term itself has to be unpacked by understanding that it is in, it's not an op opposition to technocentric views of cybersecurity, which are a focus, uh, have a focus on protection of technical systems and networks, but rather it's about extending that focus to, um, to go beyond technical systems and think about the uh, cybersecurity as ensuring expression and exercise of human rights, particularly around access to information, freedom of thought, freedom of association. So those things, the protection, cybersecurity is the protection of computers, networks, and information that are central to cybersecurity, regardless of which level we look at that at, the national level, or organizational level, or even the individual level, these things, that protection should be treated as a mechanism for which to achieve human security and protect um, human rights. So in this work, which is a, a piece of research that was done in partnership with uh, UN Women Regional Office of the Asia Pacific, of Asia Pacific, we centralized the concepts of safety and well-being and look at how cybersecurity practices, uh, particularly within civil society and those who are working in the space of human rights defense, can threaten or disempower users of technology. And so this is uh, also working beyond human factors within cybersecurity, which indicate to us that people and their behaviors, their thoughts and feelings are important for cybersecurity practices. That is a component here, but it's not the central element. The central element is the um, protection of people and human rights as the function of um, cybersecurity. And this is, uh, this is really nicely supported by the Association for Progressive Communications, which have come out with a definition of cybersecurity and that, uh, that, are, that centralize human rights and suggest that um, these uh, cybersecurity and human rights in and of themselves are complementary and mutually reinforcing and interdependent. And therefore, we have to pursue them both together to promote freedom and security. So we can take uh, now the foundation of human-centric cybersecurity, and then we need to uh, then what we did is add a gendered lens on top of that, because what we're interested in is cybersecurity as a function of um, the WPS agenda, and how we can um, how we can support women and girls within the context of uh, of, of peace and security. So as I've mentioned already, the cybersecurity research tends to focus on the technical. Uh, and we are interested in taking human factors into cybersecurity, but that is both understanding psychological and behavioral factors as they shape cybersecurity, as well as a focus on human rights, harms, and safety. Alongside those two, those two critical elements, we also recognize that gender fundamentally shapes uh, cybersecurity. Oops, excuse me. Um, and that is because uh, for a few major reasons. The first is that there are gender differences in access and uses to technologies as well as interactions in online spaces. All of these things influence cybersecurity posture and cyber resilience. Uh, we also know from a, a lot of work that's been that's been happening within the um, genders gender and violence space online is that online gender dynamics tend to perpetuate power relationships that are prevalent offline. So those masculine, um, masculinized norms and uh, how they influence um, social relationships replicated in online spaces. 
And we also recognize that women experience distinct types of online violence and that these types of online violence are more persuasive for women than they are for men. This is all alongside the gender digital divide, which I'll talk about a little bit more. So what does cybersecurity look like in Southeast Asia? Well, uh, the rapid expansion of digital technologies and internet connectivity within the region, as well as the variance in terms of internet connection uh, across different countries and development across different countries has brought about very a lot of challenges. So what we see is that there are some countries within the region which are highly prepared and doing a lot of um, a lot of really critical and novel novel work in terms of governance in this area and others that are not. Uh, the OHCHR just this year released a report on, um, on uh, cybersecurity within Southeast Asia. And what they found, uh, what they suggested was that this, the regulatory instruments that are being developed within the region, where there is a high level of investment in surveillance, in, uh, in particular, are increasing what they consider to be arbitrary and disproportional restrictions on freedom of um, expression and privacy. And there were six key issues that they suggested were, um, were relevant for the region. And I'm not going to go through these in a lot of details because there's quite a bit for me to cover in the, in the presentation. But um, what I will suggest is that these, uh, these, these critical elements, uh, spreading of, of hate speech, coordinated attacks, technology surveillance, and restrictive frameworks, criminalization, and internet shutdowns. I would suggest those who are interested read this report because it's very it's very enlightening. And as I said, this is uh, this is quite aligned to um, the conversation that uh, the discussion of Nanette, where we talked about uh, where we talked about um, broader conversations that might be uh, in opposition to human rights. One of the things that's been that's come up recently is that the the General Assembly have um, expressed concerns over these uh, these broader these uh, broader consensus that is thinking that um, cyber crime and this legislation might be used to uh, to might misused against human rights defenders and endanger human rights more generally. So we see this a lot in the um, in the um, the recognition of what's happening with journalists around the world and their freedom of speech. Sorry, I'm I'm running through things relatively quickly because I know I don't have a lot of time. Uh, we focused on women civil society and human rights defenders in the region and that this group are very disproportionately affected by cyber attacks and that is because they're working with marginalized groups as in sensitive politicized topics they are often not well protected by laws and regulations where they exist they have little say in those laws and regulations and sometimes and we know this from the from direct case study work that are actually used those laws and regulations used to directly harm them and they face a gender digital divide meaning that they're less represented within the cybersecurity field and technical um technical roles and therefore they're less likely to take to take that um into their protection so we wanted to look at uh, cybersecurity risks and resilience with the goal of promoting human and digital rights of women and girls in southeast asia and what we did was quite a complex project that involved a review of the national and regional context. We did an online survey with those who are employed in civil society organizations advocating for women. Um, we interviewed a whole range of uh, women human rights defenders, but specifically those who are working in the space of digital rights as well. And then we conducted a cyber audit. I'm not going to be talking about all of this, and the report will be launched um, probably early next year. So we can, uh, those of you who are interested, can contact me about that. I just wanted to really briefly go over something that I think is of, of quite a lot of importance. This is not comparing it to other regions around the world. What this is is trends in legislation that are happening within the Southeast Asian region and the types of legislation that um, the amount of legislation within cyberspace that is um, that is happening. So you can see there in terms of the top figure, the year, there was a large increase, 15. This has collapsed across countries. Um, of new legislative and regulatory frameworks that came came about, and there were um, five in 2022. Uh, but this the count here was based on the research. So there was a lot of new legislation that's happening in this area, and um, and some of it uh, looks positive, but it may not be necessarily used uh, um, if in the same way for all people. 
So what we know about these laws in Southeast Asia is that the, the increasing number of laws and the type of laws that are happening allow for surveillance, search and seizure, and there are a whole variety of, as I said, of case studies around this where there's targeted monitoring, including CCTV cameras, collection of um, biometric data, the, um, the surveillance of protesters and taking the photos of protesters Jimmy, and using AI... Yep, great. I will um, I'll rush through the end. And the using of those types of technologies in order to target um, human rights defenders. So we know that all of these, I won't go through them in detail, have a lot of impact specifically on human rights defenders. Uh, again, I won't go through this. Basically, what I wanted to say more generally um, from this data is that uh, there are, um, as I said, there's variants in the way that uh, gender equality and internet freedom is enacted across Southeast Asia. And even in places where there are high levels of cybersecurity frameworks, they don't necessarily function in the same way for, um, for women CSOs and women human rights defenders. So needless to say, uh, in our research, we found that technology was actually at the heart of the work that civil society are uh, engaging in, or like our life or the life of our work, which was su suggested by women, and that social media was a critical asset that for, for their functioning, which was also a place where they were directly targeted. They faced a, a huge variety of cyber threats, and um, we did do some comparison to say that there was high levels of online harassment, misinformation, cyber bombing, and a huge number of, um, of our sample had false information spread about them. We also found that, uh, that there was less cyber resilience um, amongst these uh, organizations and human rights defenders than what we, than what we would hope, uh, that there some that half felt prepared could respond and recover, but that also means that half did not. And uh, we really need to, what we found in here is that we, we need to decentralize the constant new things, but actually allow people to, to use the, the features of digi te digital technology in safe and secure ways. Uh, the content and the cyber attacks that, that were faced by women CSOs and women human rights defenders were highly gendered. And I've got some... Uh, Got some um, quick case um, studies here. The photos taken without consent and fabricated the deep fakes and used to dehumanize and de um, discredit human rights defenders. That there was an idea of that the uh, human rights defenders should should expect to, to experience violence online and harassment. There were death threats and discrediting of feminist movements and silencing and removal of safe spaces for discourse. I really wanted to just focus on the last recommendation before I before I must finish, um, which is that aside from some of the, the organizational level uh, recommendations that we are putting forward, we also need to ensure, and what we're recommending from this work is that there is gender responsive means that are human centric for recourse against cyber attacks and threats. And this is made particularly difficult within a context where there is a, a the perpetrators of those cyber attacks may likely to be state actors or coordinated attacks uh, that are sponsored and um, highly or well-funded. So we need to make sure that our frameworks are aligned with this and where we are um, endorsing global frameworks, they take this into account. Thank you very much for everybody for your time. Thank you, Jamie. Um, I think this is super important and interesting research, um, and it's a piece that I could relate to a lot personally, so I really appreciate it. Um, I basically have three feedback points, one on the scope of your concepts, one on actors, and one on future steps. So with regard to scope, um, what do you actually include in the notion of threat in your research? So in your introduction, you speak of cyber attacks. Um, later, you also talk about digital literacy, misinformation, and these are all different kinds of threats, right? The mechanism about defending yourself against a cyber attack, such as doxing or stalking, is, I would say, way more direct and immediate than reducing misinformation. So should you not make a categorization of the type of threats and how this impacts marginalized communities? Um, how does the causal mechanism of threat differ here? And by extension, how does this call for different ty types of regulation? Um, at the same time, how far do you think regulation can actually reach? Like, you, at some point you made a very interesting point 
um, that cybercrime legislation is being like misused to target human rights defenders. So I think this is a very relevant and interesting point. And I think you can make a similar argument about harassers sometimes weaponizing anti-harassment tools built into digital platforms, basically to harass other people, or that they pick certain platforms with the most limited options for moderation. So how effective do you think regulation actually is? Um, and at the same time, what's the alternative? Then on my second point about actors, um, it remained unclear to me who the actors in this piece really are. Uh, for instance, it would help if you could give some examples of um, women human rights defenders, women civil society organizations. Um, also, maybe some anecdotes at the start could really help the reader understand what type of cases you're talking about. And, this, and the similar thing is for th uh, applies to threats. Um, what actors are we talking about here? Um, because there's like lone wolves and trolls, but there's also coordinated attacks by groups, maybe polit political groups. So how does this affect policy recommendations? And then finally on future steps. So currently you, your recommendations are quite broad um, and I think you could make it a bit more concrete. Um, for instance, you said that social media is a critical tool for operations, but also increases risk exposure. So what instances of risk exposure on social media did you see? And how would you re recommend tackling this issue? Thank you. I give the floor to you guys. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Perfect. Thank you to the chair. Uh, thank you to GigaNet and IGF for uh, hosting us today in Kyoto on a very lovely morning. Uh, and thank you to uh, Kamesh for making it just in time. Uh, unfortunately, he had to miss his flight, but he got a new flight today and he made it in time. So that's great to see. So first of all, just very quickly introducing myself. My name is Kazim Rizvi. I'm the founding director of The Dialogue. We are a tech policy think tank based out of New Delhi, India. And uh, 
we work across multiple issues. One of them is AI, and we are really excited to present this paper, which is authored by Kamish, along with his colleagues who are in India. Most likely, they are enjoying their Sunday morning, unlike Kamish and me, but I think we are having a better time presenting this paper. Uh, so very quickly, we, we, wanna, we don't want to waste too much time. So very quickly, what is the objective and what we're trying to do here? And as you see on the titles, uh, this is basically looking at enabling responsible AI in India. And we've come up with some principles. And these are principles which we believe need to be implemented at different stages. And the uniqueness about this paper is that the principles cut across the development stage of AI, the deployment, as well as the usage by various actors and consumers. I think that's where the uniqueness lies in the paper, and that's what we're trying to do, because this has not been discussed in India, at least till today. And that's the idea for us to sort of uh, work on this paper. <clears throat> So if we move to the next slide, uh, just sort of going through the outline very quickly. Uh, and I think, you know, in the last year or so, we've been accustomed to hearing the word AI a lot more, right? With the rise of generative AI applications, most of you in this room and listening to us online are having a direct interaction with some sort of model. Uh, and what we see as researchers is that the technology is moving away from just a B2B to a B2C technology, where consumers are directly interfacing with AI models to you know, uh, help them with their daily tasks, professional duties, etc. And we are also seeing AI proliferate across multiple ecosystems, such as social media, education, finance, so a lot of uh, what we see today is driven by algorithms. In many ways, you know, the term we coined is algorithms are the atom of the internet, right? You cannot live without them. And they make or they sort of create the structure of the internet, which is the modern internet as of today, and the services which are provided. So for example, you know, I, ha I, I have a cat in my house, and uh, I go on a social media, and then I'm seeing multiple options to you know, buy different type of food and stuff for, for, for the cat. So, and he's a very handsome cat, by the way. And he, he sort of eats very specific kind of food. But if you s go to social media and you sort of post some pictures, then you'll be you know, getting uh, different, different type of suggestions and interventions. So it's really taking over in terms of uh, giving you ideas, giving you inputs. Uh, from the music you listen to, the kind of, uh, you know, the places you want to visit. It's really everywhere in our lives today. So while it's doing a lot of good things, there are certain challenges, right? And I think that's where uh, the focus for us has been. And if we may go to the next slide, um, what we've tried to do here in this paper is understand those challenges and identify what are the implementing frameworks, governments, scholars, development organizations, multilateral organizations, tech companies have to work towards as well as civil society, right? So that's, that's the focus for us. Uh, and what we've really done is we've sort of mapped out uh, certain specific ways of identifying responsible AI. Um, Maybe we can move to the next slide. Yeah. So in this paper, we've, we've mapped impacts and harm. And what we've done is we've looked at AI at the development stage, so the design and development at the algorithmic development model stage, where we've analyzed what are the harms which could take place when uh, you're designing the technology, when you're really coding it, when you're sort of, uh, sort of coming up with algorithms, when you're collecting data, what kind of data you're collecting, how should you collect the data, what is the, what is the authenticity, et cetera. So that is one stage uh, which we've understood. And the second stage is the harm stage, which is the post-development uh, deployment stage, when the technology is deployed by industries. It could be you know, uh, horizontal industries such as finance, education, climb, uh, uh, even uh, environment, sustainability, <coughs> social media, 
um, whatever industry is using the technology, there are certain harms present over there. So how do we protect ourselves from those harms? So these are the two stages which we've come up with. And again, this is a very unique approach because most of the principles which you see, be it the OECD principles or the UNICEF principles or different multilateral principles or bilateral principles, they're mostly focusing on the uh, deployment sort of uh, stage. And this is something which we have sort of figured out that design, imp uh, deployment, and development, all three stages have to be met. And that's the focus for the paper. So you go to the next slide. Um, it's pretty much sort of summing up uh, you know, what we are doing. So three stakeholders, which is the developer, and then you have the de deployer, and then the end user, the end population. What are the principles for the end population as well? So let's say if you develop a health tech application, there are principles for the technologist, the coders who have designed the application. There are principles for the hospitals, clinics, uh, doctors who are using the technology. And then there are principles when it comes to you know, how consumers are interfacing with the technology and how do you protect them as well. So these are the three stages and the stakeholders. Uh, so then we've really mapped these harms across the AI life cycle. Uh, and over here, Kamesh, if you want to quickly come in and talk a little bit about how we've done these mapping of different principles and what those principles are. Um, I hope I'm audible. Yeah, I guess I am. So uh, thank you, Kasim, like for setting the context for the paper itself. Uh, so um, just like coming from where you left itself, like, you know, what the paper is trying to do and why this is a unique way of like looking at things is basically um, most of the uh, basically, most of the times when we are like, you know, most of the uh, frameworks which are available outside there, like, is like overly like concentrated on the risk management which comes at the AI developer level. But like, what we have like went about doing is that is like looked into a 360 degree approach where we wanted to move beyond the developer and ask a question about like, if at all a developer is designing a technology ethically, does that does that mean that like, you know, when a technology is deployed or used? there will not be any fall through the cracks happening. So just to answer this question is where like we have come up with like the model of principle based, um, you know, ecosystem approach. And like the model is basically talks about as Kazim mentioned is like, you know, mapping all the principles for various stakeholders who come within the ecosystem itself, such that like collectively we could actually en ensure that some of the um, uh, adverse impacts that we have mapped doesn't happen. So firstly, what we have done is like, came up, firstly what we did is like, we took like five adverse impacts and we chose um, uh, exclusion, false prediction, and like, you know, copyright infringement, uh, privacy concerns, and information disorder itself. Why these five is basically because like, these are the most, you know, top five um, aspects which are like talked about when it comes to AI implications itself. But like, this is not an exhaustive list. This is like just a start of like what we are doing. Um, then what we went about doing is like as Kazim already mentioned, we tried to like look at impact and harm. For us, impact and harm is merely is this that like impact is just an, um, a construct of like a harm which could happen later and like how much you are like aware of that. And harm is obviously the like you know exposed itself and the you know the actual harm happens. So our ideology behind this slide itself is this: how this um, you know the first aspect of our like paper itself is that to like whenever we talk about exclusion or like any of these um, you know adverse impacts, like we don't really look at from the granular level where like there are different stakeholders involved at a different like um, stages of the AI life cycle itself contributing at the different levels, which accumulates into like something like an exclusion happening. So we went about like, you know, going and mapping all of those impacts and harms, uh, which occurs at the different stages of the, um, you know, the uh, life cycle of the AI itself. One important aspect here, if you could look into the slide is like, we have like two important ex additional stages that we have added, which is the gray, which is your actual oper operationalization, which is at the deployment level. And um, then we went about like doing it at the direct usage, which is what like Kazim mentioned about like, you know, B2C um, implications coming into the picture. So uh, next slide. Yeah. 
Um, I think we skipped one. Oh yeah, now it's working. Now it's working. Now it's working. Yeah, now it is working. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so mm, hmm. yeah, this is the one. So now that we know impact and harms are mapped, then what the paper goes about doing is like you know mapping various principles that could be followed by different stakeholders at the different stages of the um, life cycle. And here, if you could see, these are like, you know, some of the principles which have been like extracted from globally available uh, frameworks like your OECD, UN and EU and et cetera and stuff. Um, and also India's like, you know, G20 declaration, which also speaks about some of these principles. In addition to that, from our research also, we have like we suggested some new principles. So after principles, what we go about doing is that is the operationalization. Here, the unique aspect that the paper tries to do is that like is um, like when we talk about human in the loop as a principle, most of the times, like we just use the term as pass by, but when it comes to operationalization, that particular principle means differently at different stages of the life cycle. And that exact difference is what like we wanted to like bring out from this paper. For example, if you could look at this at the planning to the build and use stage, human in the loop really means that like you want to like engage with your stakeholders and et cetera and stuff. Whereas for the actual operationalization stage, it could mean that like you have to give a human anatomy to people, a subjected human anatomy to people where they could also like take some decisions against whatever the AI decision has been given. So they have brought out like such differences into like picture um, within the operationalization. Um, now, the, now that impact is done, operationalization, sorry, principles are mapped, operationalization is done. Finally, the paper to just give a holistic approach, we also talk about the implementation which comes from your government. Here, because like our research is extensively in Indian context, so we went about looking at like, you know, what is, um, what can be done by the Indian context in terms of like implementing such a framework, where we look at like a domestic coordination which is important within the legislations. And then international cooperation is important because various like um, aspects are happening at like different, uh, um, you know, um, institutional level and like jurisdictional level and like bilateral level, et cetera, and stuff. Also like India moving towards a chair of being GPAI, I guess like this is like this paper adds a great value in terms of starting that conversation. Just one minute. And finally, we also talk about like establishing a public and private collaboration in terms of like, how we can implement it. And like this is something that like as an organization we keep pushing in terms of like it not necessarily has to be something at the compliance level. It can also come in the level of like, you know, making it like a, you know, value proposition for the businesses to take it. So okay, that's I'm gonna, what I'm gonna cut you off here, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I think you bring up a very relevant question um, that addresses a lot of blind spots in current academia. Um, and instead of looking at only developers, you also look at deployers and their role in responsible use of AI. And basically, you have three main points of feedback, uh, one on the focus of your argument, one on the narrowing down of concepts, and one on your causal mechanisms. So with the focus of your argument, like I said, instead of looking at developers, you look at deployers. Um, but I wondered why not also focus on uh, users, like end users? So you think users, like I, I don't think you think that users have no role to play in responsible and ethical use of AI, right? And especially since you talk a lot about generative um, AI, this is often steered by end users. So um, what is your perception on their role to like that and their role that they play um, in the responsible use of AI. Uh, second, um, on narrowing down concepts, um, I think often you can make your argument more concrete. So for instance, on page 16, you argue that um, the AI solutions might be producing an error or maybe designed to capture some biased parameters to produce a suggested outcome. However, real life harms of such outcomes only translate into action when AI deployers blindly use the same for making real life decisions. So f like in this case, I was like, okay, but then what, what do you mean by real life harms? What do you mean by real life decisions? Uh, what do you mean with AI solutions, you know? So this sometimes gets so broad that it could mean anything. And I think sometimes specifying what you mean would actually help uh, making your argument. So um, 
Arguments often remain quite abstract, and I think you can make it more concrete by basically defining what do you mean by AI, what do you mean by AI solutions, and just mention, mention a couple of examples. Um, and then finally, on conceptualization and causal mechanisms, um, we saw the figure as well on the AI life cycle. I had a number of questions about this model. So on a more general level, it kind of remained unclear to me where this model is kind of derived from. Where does this come from? How, like, how, how did you like, arrive at this model? So I think you need a bit more like, okay, what is already out there? Um, and like, what did we use to like, come, come to this model? Second, you argue, argue that you want to focus on deployers, but the largest model, part of the model is still developers. So it's not completely in line with the argument that you make in, your, in, in the paper. You know, you say, okay, everybody focus on developers, we focus on deployers, but then in the model, in the AI lifecycle, it's mostly developers. Um, so what really is the role of deployers in this model? And then finally, um, I thought it was interesting, there's this, um, like the top two categories were like exclusion and false prediction, um, but there was no impact on end users, and I wondered why. Because I thought like, it, like I can, there's a lot of impact on end users if we think about exclusion and false predictions, right? Um, so these were my points. Um, I would like to open up the floor if people have questions or comments or, Yes, and then after we collect, we go back to the panel. Anybody else? Yes, yeah, so um, I'm gonna ask you a really tough question, uh, but it's more an attempt to make a general point about how messed up our dialogue about AI is rather than focusing on you, because I think your mapping out there of uh, this ecosystem was actually a pretty interesting contribution and, and worthwhile. But you open your paper by saying, uh, invoking the invention of the printing press, right? Now, can you uh, use your imagination and try to project for me what would have happened if the authorities and the public in uh, 1452 had decided they were going to regulate printing? And what do you think would have resulted from that? Uh, do we have any other questions in the room? Because otherwise I, we can go back to the pan panel. We can go in reverse order. Um, we have like nine minutes left, so that would be like three minutes max. Sure. So to your question uh, on, on printing press, so in this paper, we haven't suggested that AI should be regulated. Right. What, what we are saying is that, look, there are certain harms associated with the use of AI, which we have to be careful of. And we have to work towards developing some frameworks and principles around these harms which we've identified. So while we ourselves are not sort of suggesting that it has to be regulated heavily, but we are already seeing that in data protection legislations across the globe, AI is regulated as it is, right? Um, we, we've not taken a stand that, look, it has to, you have to sort of come up with very strong regulations to, you know, sort of really bucket it into different kind of, uh, you know, technologies which should or should not be used. But maybe in the next 10, 15 years, as the usage grows, we may move towards soft regulations as the time may come. Uh, but at the same time, we are also very clear that these are principles which will help in improving the effectiveness of the technology. No, I mean, uh, the same argument goes for fire. The same argument we can apply for fire as well, that, yeah, or, or wheels, or any, any new technology. Uh, of course, if you, if you regulate it heavily at that time, we may not have seen what we see today but eventually it was. So the same argument applies to this, that an AI has been around for a few decades now. Uh, it's not like the technology is very new of late. It's been there for a while, but we are not suggesting that look, put very strict or very hard regulations to begin with. What we are suggesting it look, move slowly, but watch out for harms as they take place. And self-regulation, I mean, you look at the industry, you look at self civil society, you need some sort of frameworks and discussions and 
conferences like these are a means to also put that con uh, you know uh, discussion into context that look we need to move towards more responsible deployment of ai and what that means even we don't know i mean we are all studying this uh, a lot of scholars globally are trying to figure out what is really responsible ai uh, as much as responsible printing press or responsible use of fire would be this quickly coming in on your very quickly coming in your points like there is like too many things to like discuss and like whatever you have said like we can take it offline too um on the very first thing on like um impact population and like end users so basically the paper does that um where it also says that like you know as we as a end users and impact population use such technologies how should we responsibly use it so there are like certain principles and there are certain operationalization things that we talk there so second thing that uh, on your question on where is this you know the life cycle comes from is like derived from nist and oecd and etc and stuff in addition to that we have added some aspects of our own and we have also validated how we think that is important within the paper um third thing about like um, um if you could repeat your third point or like it was something on the exclusion and stuff. well I, i don't think we have time we okay, can fine, i think we sure. should take it um, to the break um no no lab okay um we can uh go back to jamie uh for like last um last points and then we can wrap it up i think Jamie, are you still there? Yeah. Yes. Yes, I'm still here. Um, thank you, and thank you very much, um, Danielle, for your for your comments. Just to, I will be very brief in these because I I obviously don't have a lot of um, chance to go over them in detail. And you brought up some really really good points. Uh, just to just to say, we had a a very comprehensive list of threats that we asked about experiences at both the personal and the organizational level. And um, and the, uh, we had uh, we also had some open ended information so people could add more. Uh, there is a lot going to be a lot more information about that in the in the report. You also asked about anecdotes in terms of actors. Um, this this is a very sensitive issue, and um, and I think you know in terms of. Uh, diplomacy we need to and what what that looks like we did ask about perpetrators and who they think the perpetrators are and obviously we have to be considered that that is perceptual as i as i mentioned right at the very beginning and there are a range of i of state and non-state actors and as i said most of them in terms of the in terms of the stories were very coordinated and so uh that is when we're experiencing but on social media um, and what those attacks look like, obviously, they're sometimes very difficult to trace, but we can definitely trace some of the surveillance software as it was used, and, um, and that's very relevant to the South Asian context. Uh, I, I did want to very briefly end on, um, well, first off, say that, yes, your recommendation, your your point about the recommendations being more concrete is very well taken and we're working with the um, civil society right now in order to co-create those more uh, but the last thing I, and what I wanted to end on was your very important point and I agree with this entirely the misuse of regulation and, um, and, um, and law and policy uh, against human rights defenders or against journalists or advocates and those who, are, who speak out I think this is an incredibly important point that is, that is very nuanced and the ones that I really want to highlight and pay attention to are those ones that are considered to be um, anti-terrorism and cyber, the, the more gen generic cybercrime laws that um, really put those who are potentially speaking out uh, in a place where they could be uh, legislated against. And I think that's something that we need to we need to very strongly consider when we're taking kind of more global and international regulatory frameworks uh, because they can do the opposite. And just having cybersecurity policy in place does not mean that it's in place in a way that's protective against human rights. So thank you for bringing that up and that's where I'll end. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, thanks, Jamie. Thanks everybody for uh, who was on this panel and for participating. Also thanks to Nanette, even though she's no longer here. Um, yes, um, I think we can go to the break. Everybody give, please give a hand to the panelists.